All right, guys, so we're back again, uh, and we're on the Cisco Firewall Teach to Fish hardware selection segment. And this is gonna be a pretty long one, and I don't have a whole bunch of slides because this is gonna be a lot of interactive demonstration searching so that you guys can learn kind of the way to go about routing out some of this information that you typically would look for. So let's get started here. This is the Cisco Firewall Teach to Fish, covering the initial architecture, engineering, and implementation. So not the stuff where you're gonna be looking at dashboards and analysis, but where you're trying to seek out the mean time to failure or electrical load or BTUs, things like that. So first off, let's take a look at our agenda. We're gonna look at physical appliances, and this is just to help you do a quick rough sizing. And I'm talking super rough, like napping math, and that's because a lot of people do look at this type of stuff when they have very simple implementations. And then we're gonna look at the real meat and potatoes of doing a chassis selection. And I say chassis because the firepower hardware is separate and distinct from the software that can run on it. Now this is a firepower specialized course. So I'm not gonna cover all of the software, but you'll get the idea as we go along. <clears throat> all right, so here's the physical appliances to start. And you can see this is a great slide for getting a rough idea uh, of how these work. Now, it doesn't present everything, but most people, for the most part, when they come to building a design, they have throughput front and foremost in their mind and then kind of scale or scalability. And so that's why these are broken down with the models, the 1010 being the smallest, the 1100s, the series is next, the 2000 series, 4000 and 9000 series. And then we've got kind of a redheaded stepchild up here, the ISA 3000. So these are progressively in order of higher throughput, which typically signifies a larger enterprise or footprint to support. And then this guy up here is because he is a very specialized unit. And these are specialized units for people that are in areas that are uh, harder to get to or higher temperature operations areas. Uh, they have things like conformal coatings and additional environmental certifications tied to them. Now they run more than just firepower, but this is the universal industrial security appliance, ISA, that Cisco provides to run a multitude of software that needs to be run inside of these adverse environments. Okay, so let's think about all the things you typically want to go through when you're looking to select a chassis. Uh, obviously throughput is typically there. You wanna consider some additional features like scale. How many devices or hosts are going to be talking to this? There's a certain metric called connections per second, uh, where you're not only looking at how much throughput can go through it, but what if you have like a billion phones with very little traffic, but there's thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of connections being initiated, or some sort of bot script running in a data center that needs to reach out and establish millions of connections per second. That's the type of scaling you wanna look at. You also wanna look at how easy it is, is it to grow later. You may want to deploy a cluster now and then have the ability to easily insert a new one without interrupting or re-engineering your deployment. And there is some selections you can make that will help your uh, equipment scale better. So for a 1000 or 2000 series, there's not a whole lot of scale or scaling to be had there. But when you get to the 4000 or 9000 series, you see some interesting technologies such as clustering or multi-instance or multi-instance and clustering, inter and intra-chassis clustering. These are, this is clustering between many logical devices on one box or clustering between two physical device or more physical devices and or two or more logical devices across many uh, firewalls across many devices. You wanna look at things like electrical load or amperage when you're playing out data center capacities. And in some cases that also will correlate to BTUs. Now, Cisco doesn't explicitly list BTU output. They used to, I don't know why they switch, but it's simply calculated based on the wattage times 3.41. And you might think, well, why don't they just list BTUs? And it really has a lot to do with load. Part of this whole series is to kind of demystify some of these erroneous uh, assumptions that are made where it can cause you to be upset or have consternation with the way this data is presented. The amperage draw, how much electricity is being used on a device, has a lot to do with what it's doing in that very moment. You have a discrete set of CPU, memory, and disk space, and that CPU and memory is the most intensive part that draws power, generates heat. That heat causes the fans to kick on and run. But the idea is the more you have it doing, the more amperage draw, the more BTU. So it's not very simple to just say this box produces this many BTUs. 
it is a dynamic instrument based on how much you're having it uh, run. Now we do list the maximum wattage amperage on the data sheets. So you can calculate the maximum BTU capacity. And that stuff is found in things like the data sheet. And what I've listed over here is the easiest way to kind of feed yourself or find this information. Um, so I'm gonna show you kind of how that works here in a second. Another thing you might wanna look at is airflow. Does air flow from front to back or back to front? And that's important when you're planning hot and cold aisles if that is your cooling mechanism for your data centers where these are located or your closet wherever you happen to place these. So let's go take a look at this. If I wanna see some of this information, say I'm getting, I'm looking at the roughly the 2000 series, I would just simply go to Google and say, Firepower 2000 data sheet. And once I pull that up, now it says 2100 data sheet, I can go with that. And you can see here it's got the 2110, 2120, 30, and 40. And you get a list here of a lot of the good information. Now they give you, a, generally speaking, the maximum throughput for the firewall when it's running uh, as a firewall with either NGFW, that's your firepower threat defense code inspecting traffic, or IPS, that's your firepower threat defense code inspecting traffic but out of line, not in line. So you've got it sitting over somewhere with a span or a tap feeding it traffic. It is not actively in the data path, but it can detect and alert you that something malicious has crossed your network. It lists generally the interfaces, how many of them there are and what type of interface they are. So RJ45, copper, and or SFPs, at which point you get to choose what type of interface you want it to be, whether it's optical or copper and the speeds, generally speaking. Now, SFP only goes up to 100 meg, SFP plus can go up to 10 gig, and then you got some fancy 10 gig SFP plus on higher end models, all things you may want to look at. Now, dissecting this data sheet, you get a per model estimated throughput. And you have to understand these numbers presented here, and they caveat it well, is per picture perfect 1024 byte average packet size. It doesn't mean in this test every packet is 1024 bytes, but it means generally speaking across all of the packets sent through in the test set to generate this data, it averaged 1024. And that's important because that's not normal internet traffic. That's not normal traffic in any enterprise for the most part. But we have to have a standard with which to test against. And most vendors will test with fat packets so that they can show on their data sheet they have a huge throughput number. Now that's 1024. If I change this to 9,000 byte packets, which are super fat packets, they're jumbo frames, but they're not realistic, then this number would go up proportionally. You could probably get about, I don't know, six, seven gigs going through here just because you're sending less headers and a lot more data through each packet. Um, once you start inspecting, then it becomes another game. You start inspecting, you're sending everything through Snort, then your throughput typically will decrease. Now these have been designed in Firepower Threat Defense so that even if you're not inspecting, there's cores reserved for inspection, so your throughput doesn't decrease when you're comparing non-inspection traffic to inspection traffic, IPS. All right, here's where all the data is, bottom line. Lots of information you might want to look at, like IPsec VPN throughput, how many peers it can have, whether it's managed locally or remotely, all the things that are interesting to you. So let's go back to our presentation real quick. We've gone through all of these as considerations. And you notice I have a Firepower Hardware Installation Guide and Firepower EOL EOS uh, search here. That's because when you're engineering a design, you don't want to adopt a hardware platform that is going to go end of life this year or next year, or has already been announced end of life and reaching end of life next year. So let's get some bottom line things out of the way. End of life, end of support. If Cisco has announced end of life for a device, you have five years before that device falls off a cliff and has reached end of support. End of life and end of support are separate and discrete for hardware versus software. So software may go end of life two years after it's created because you're on 6.4 and now we're moving to 6.5 or 6.6 or 6.7, but hardware lasts a pretty long time. <coughs> so the separate and distinct EOL on the Firepower 9300 chassis does not mean end of life for Firepower code, bottom line. You wanna look at things like form factor, right? If we look at the Firepower 1K, we're gonna go back two slides, it's a half rack unit. It's actually less than that, but essentially it cannot be rack mounted unless you buy a special adapter kit or a shelf. Might be important to you, might not. The whole point of this chassis is to throw it on somebody's desk essentially. And there's one unique caveat to the hardware 
and software support that only applies to the 1010. It is the only device that has native built-in switch ports. Every other Firepower chassis, you cannot do switching on the switch ports. You cannot do switching on the interfaces. The 1010, you can. And that's because it's made for small office, home office type stuff. All right, that aside, the 1000 series is one rack unit. 2000 series is one rack unit, but it's a longer chassis. 4000 series is a one rack unit, also a slightly longer chassis. The 9300 series is a three rack unit chassis, and it is heavy, extremely heavy. So keep that in mind. Um, the ISA, on the other hand, is obviously not even a half rack unit. It's a very odd square cube shape. You wanna look at the dimensions. How can you do that? Pull up the hardware sheet on it. How do you do that? You go Google with these terms. It's fantastic. All right, temperature. You might wanna be interested in running something at 102 degrees. Well, that's when you'd be looking at the ISA uh, 3000, Industrial Security Appliance. Um, things like conformal coating to stop like water and electric interference on the circuit board. And we've covered the switch ports being unique to the Firepower 1K. So if we look at this again, some things you might want to look at. I showed you the data sheet. If I'm looking, hey, what's the Firepower 2110 EOL? That's all I have to do. Search for end of life, end of sale notice. Now there is no 2100 or 2110 EOL. It has not happened yet. So I didn't find anything. But there are some chassis that have, and I'm just going to use an older chassis, not the Firepower, because those aren't EOL yet. Let's say ASA 5505 EOL. You can see this is the 5505, again, the hardware, not the software. I click it and it'll tell me, hey, it went end of life, February 24, 2017. What I can infer from that is five years later, so 2022 is gonna be end of support. And that's when the hardware, you cannot service it anymore, get updates for the hardware or fix anything. It's not gonna be covered under any warranties or any service contracts. It is dead. The next time it fails, you've gotta throw it in a dumpster. So you want to move away from these before they hit that point, or at least plan your migration so that you're moving when this date hits. <clears throat> All right, so why did I list the installation guide? So there's some very rare things that you might want to look at that for some reason are not in the normal uh, data sheets. And that's things like certain certifications. So if you want a hardware chassis that's been FIPS 140-2 certified, many of the times you have to come to the hardware installation guide and it's in a little chart somewhere. Where is it? Do, 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 do. Maybe I have to find it over here. Ah, right here. You go to security standard certifications. You know, this is a Firepower 21 series. It's in the overview for the installation guide. Common criteria, FIPS, DOD, Doden, USG6. All of those are listed here. Now, there's also some other good stuff here if you're wondering how many CPUs there are and what clock speed they're running at, how much RAM and how many sticks of RAM, what types of chips are being used for the NPU, i.e. the encryption chips. Uh, all of that stuff's here. Really good information, really useful for you. So that's it. I think that's about it for all of the chassis selection criteria. For the most part, again, this is a 10,000 foot overview uh, and we'll go ahead and move on. Have a good one, guys. See you next time.